Hello, this is Mr. Wolf, and we are continuing to read Chains by Laurie Hall Sanderson. And we are on to chapter 18. Friday, June 28th, 1776. Received information that a most horrid plot was on foot by the vile Tories of this place to assassinate His Excellency and the other general officers blow up the gunpowder magazine, spike the cannon, etc. Hope they will receive the punishment due such infamous wretches. Journal of Samuel B. Webb, Washington's aide-de-camp. Shortly after the clock struck ten on Friday morning, thousands of boots echoed against the cobblestones of, of Broadway. Every soldier in New York was marching up island to attend the hanging of Thomas Hickey, the man who almost assassinated George, General George Washington. Becky urged me to go. There's nothing like a good hanging, is there? She gave the face of the grandfather clock another swipe with the dust rag. Keep an eye on your sister, though. Little ones disappear in big crowds. What about madam? I asked. Nothing to worry about there, eh? Becky pointed upstairs, where Madam lay atop the, the coverlet on her bed asleep. She had stayed muddy in strong wine since Lockton left the city. The thought of a hanging turned my belly, but Colonel Reagan would likely be there. Perhaps he would provide an escort for Ruth and me, direct from the gallows to the wharf. Go on, Becky said again. It'll be good for you to get some air. Fetch a bucket of water home with you. Mind, I wager Madam will wake with a thumping headache. Ruth and I found ourselves in a tide of people moving north. The waves spread out once it reached the commons, where the prison, the barracks, and a large sugar house stood. Beyond the hills, to the north, lay the African burial ground, and beyond that, a big pond called the Collect. This was the one spot in the city where twenty thousand folk could gather. I could scarce credit the number, but it was on everyone's lips. Ruth watched the crowd with big eyes and shy smiles for strangers, but she did not release my hand and kept her doll baby clutched tight to her. I half expected to see vendors selling cinnamon water, boiled sweets, and currant cakes, and, conjure, and a conjure man who would, could juggle two balls and a stool. There were none in sight, but the air of high spirits made it feel like a fair day. I took Ruth by the hand and led her around the backside of Bridwell Prison toward the tea water pump where there were all, where other slaves and servants gathered. I nodded polite and murmured my good day to the old man we called grandfather and the others who were familiar. Ruth sat at in, sat in the dust and turned our bucket upside down, sat on it and pulled a length of string from my pocket, and wove it into a fanciful pattern with my fingers, around my fingers. Cratch Kate Cradle, Ruth said, clapping her hands. We lost ourselves in play, our fingers making candles, triangles, diamonds, and the manger. Suddenly, there came a rough shout from the center of the commons. The crowd muttered, some folks craning their necks to see. Ruth giggled and held out her hands to me. She had made a complete mishmash of the string and could not untangle her fingers from the knot. There came another shout. Then the drummers started beating their snares. The noise crackled like lightning. Game's over, I said to Ruth freeing her hands and pulling her to her feet. The crowd surrounding the commons had swelled to include the entire army and every soul in the city except for Madame and Becky. I scanned the rows of officers lined up behind the gallows, looking for Colonel Reagan. 
I could pick out General Washington astride his big gray horse at the center of the line. Next to him was the rather large figure of Colonel Knox, and countless other officers I could not name. Colonel Reagan was not to be seen, but he could have been in the bat rows to the back. Blast! I should have realized that they would be in formation, not scattered amongst the common folk. Another shouted order echoed off the stone front of the prison. Near one hundred soldiers stepped out of the ranks and snapped to attention. Bayonets fixed to the ends of their long muskets flashed in the sun. The drummers continued beating. Sweat trickled down their faces. Bet you never saw this out in the country, a familiar voice said in my ear. I swirled with a gasp. Curzon laughed at my astonishment. Miss me? he asked. What are you doing here? Where have you been? I asked fighting to keep my voice low. Much is afoot. He nodded his head toward the gallows. So I see. I opened my mouth to ask the first of a thousand questions, but he quickly put a finger to his lips. Shh, he warned. Ruth put her arms in the air and grunted. She was tired of staring at the backsides of people crowding around us. I shook my head. You're too bid big to pick up. No, she's not. Before I could protest, Curzon tossed his ridiculous hat at me and lifted Ruth up to perch, to a perch on his left shoulder. She squealed with delight and a little fear and hung on to his neck so tightly he looked like he looked to choke. I glanced at the red hat in my hands. A name was written on a scrap of fabric affixed to the crown. James. James? I wondered aloud. If he heard me, Curzon took no notice. His eyes raked the crowd, looking intently, but giving no clue about what he sought. I cupped my hands to my mouth and whispered in his ear, When will they send for Ruth and me? Colonel Reagan promised to help. The world turns upside down every day. He kept his eyes straight ahead in one hand on Ruth's back to hold her steady. The time will come, you'll see. The drums beat faster. My heart sped up to match the rhythm. The drums stopped. Here he comes, someone called. A guard marched Hickey out of the prison and across the yard to the gallows, his uniform dirty but buttoned. He kept his eyes on the steps that led up to the platform. He did not look at the rope that awaited him. The crowd had recovered its voice and was screaming vile curses. Cabbages, rotten apples, and, and a dead cat were thrown in the direction of the traitor. He flinched as an egg sailed past his nose, but the men holding his elbow kept their backs straight and their boots marching forward. Hickey was halted in front of the captain of the guard. The captain said something that we couldn't hear. Then he pulled the sword from his scabbard and sliced the epaulets off Hickey's shoulders. He folded them and placed them in his pocket, then brought the sword down in a sweep across the front of Hickey's chest, neatly slicing off the buttons from the traitor's coat. The buttons fell one by one into the dust. Ruth stopped giggling. A preacher stepped out of the crowd and approached Hickey, a Bible in his hand. The captain nodded curtly at the preacher and said something else to Hickey, again too low for us to hear. Hickey said nothing, but he had started to tremble. The captain spat on Hickey's boots, took one step back, and slid his sword home into the scabbard. The preacher murmured to Hickey, and got no response, so took him by the hand and led him to the wooden stairs that led up to his fate. He's crying, I said. Good, Curzon said. When he got to the top of the steps, Hickey turned around so the hangman could bind his wrists behind him. 
the drummers started beating their snares again, louder than before. The aide on horseback next to General Washington spoke, and the general leaned forward to hear better. He was by far the tallest man in sight. He agreed with whatever the aide said and patted his horse's neck. The animal tossed its mane and, paid, and pawed at the ground. The crowd had grown so loud that Ruth released Curzon's neck and covered her ears with her hands. She whimpered once. I held out my arms, and she slid into them. I lowered her to the ground. She stood near on top of my t shoes, grasped my apron, and stuck her thumb in her, in her mouth. The hangman led Hickey to the center of the platform. He placed the knotted noose around Hickey's neck, tightened it, then helped him climb onto an upright barrel. The captain of the guard raised his hand. The drumming stopped. The crowd fell still. The captain of the guard unrolled a sheet of paper and read the charges in a loud voice. Thomas Hickey, you have been court-martialed and found guilty of the capital crimes of mutiny and sedition of holding a treacherous correspondence with and receiving pay from the enemy for the most horrid and detestable purposes. And you have been sentenced to hang from the neck until dead. You are a disgrace to your country. He rolled the paper back up. May God have mercy on your soul. With that pronouncement, the hangman kicked the barrel away. The crowd gasped. I covered Ruth's eyes with my hands and closed my own. And that is the end of chapter 18. Thank you for joining us, and I will see you again soon.